Hey internet friends, for most of American history, our diets were seasonal, limited to what could be grown in the garden, preserved, and stored in a root cellar. Nowadays, in the age of plenty, food is produced less as a necessity and more of a competitive commodity, with corporations offering an endless array of choices to consumers. 200 years ago, the average American consumed around two pounds of added sugar a year. But today, we eat around 55 pounds of added sugar per year, a jarring total of two tons of added sugar in a lifetime. But we might see a sharp decrease in those numbers soon. Not because Americans are consuming less sugar, but because projected lifespans are on the decline, with the leading causes of death in America ranging from heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. Not terrorism and mass shootings as the around-the-clock news coverage would have you believe. That's why today we're going to discuss the tobacco of our generation, the real white devil we affectionately refer to as sugar. So let's begin. Colonial America revolved primarily around agriculture, and meals were generally limited to what was in season, as fresh fruits and vegetables were not available year-round, and meat was restricted to what could be freshly harvested from one's own property and preserved accordingly. Typical sugar consumption during these times consisted of fresh fruits, honey, the occasional treat in the form of a baked good, as well as sweetened alcoholic beverages. This was the case for most of our history, up until the advent of industrialization and urbanization, when people left their farms to begin working at factories within the city. The great shift was compounded by farmers leaving home to join the war effort during the First World War. Eventually, farming reached a low point in 1932, when many Americans were knee-deep in the Great Depression, barely getting by. The government responded accordingly, as they always tend to do in a very Hegelian dialectic sort of fashion, attempting to reinvigorate farms during this time, but basically small farmers were phased out. And the big guys got bigger, especially with the introduction of new machinery that largely reduced the need for agricultural labor. To summarize, people went from growing and cooking their own food, to moving into the cities and relying on government-subsidized farms to provide for the population. There was a brief moment there when victory gardens were considered patriotic during war times and were promoted by the government, and people had a temporary stretch of growing their own food again. But that moment was fleeting, because as time went on, the innovations in agriculture, from harvesting to processing, allowed the food supply to flourish. The age of cows and plows was over and the age of farming while sitting down had begun. Which brings us to the Eisenhower era of the 1950s. The unprecedented economic prosperity the United States experienced in the post-World War II boom not only inspired confidence and optimism in the face of mounting international tensions, but this prosperity also gave way to a smorgasbord of conveniences that supplied a seemingly unlimited host of offerings to the age-old question. What's for dinner? Well, the answer was whatever you'd like. And even better, you and your family were able to eat your dinner in front of a television now, just in time for the nightly programming. Not only did microwaves and TV dinners come into vogue during this time, but diners and later drive throughs with their hamburgers, french fries, and milkshakes would emerge as a staple in the American diet, using popular cartoon characters to appeal to children through television advertising, with the goal to get parents to bring their children through the golden arches for a happy meal in an afternoon frolicking around the ball pit at the Play Palace. It's kind of sinister if you think about it, but at the time it seemed harmless and fun. That being said, it's important to note that there's a definite trend that emerged during this time that we still see today. Television advertising, American fast food corporations, and consumer food corporations working in perfect perverse harmony together, targeting children and adults alike. Because these folks realized long before it was common knowledge that junk food, and in particular, added sugar, is addictive. There's actual evidence in science to back up this claim. You see, sugar, as it's used by corporations today, is more like a drug and less like a food, having immediate effects on the body and the brain. Fructose, which is one of the two major components of added sugar along with glucose, is the main culprit here. 
Studies have shown that while glucose can be used by every cell in the body, only the liver can metabolize fructose in significant amounts. That's why when people eat a high calorie and high fructose diet, the liver is overloaded and begins turning that fructose into fat. That's why too much fructose can inflame the liver and cause non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Ultimately, too much sugar can manifest as insulin resistance, which is known to make you crave more sugar and contributes to diseases like diabetes, heart disease, pancreatic cancer, gout, and kidney disease. According to the FDA, since fructose doesn't poison you after ingesting it once, it's considered safe. We know that fructose is metabolized by the liver, but the FDA says the liver doesn't get sick after one fructose-laden meal, so it gets a pass. The problem is that the liver gets sick after years worth of fructose-laden meals. And guess what the typical American diet revolves around? You got it, fructose-laden meals. The main distinction between a piece of fruit and the processed foods with added sugars that have plagued shelves for the last several decades is that fruit is naturally occurring, of low caloric density and contains loads of fiber. There's a synergy of sorts within fruits that aids in digestion and allows the body to process the sugars in a way that doesn't overload the system. However, the processed foods on our grocery store shelves contain added sugars without the balance of fiber or nutrients, designed to program the consumer to continually chase their sugar buzz. Since childhood, we've been exposed to thousands upon thousands of advertisements conditioning us to crave sweets. The more sweets we consume, the greater the addiction, and the more that these mega corporations profit. Diagnosed heart disease was an absolute rarity at the turn of the century, but by the Eisenhower era, heart disease was affecting middle-aged men at an alarming rate. When President Eisenhower suffered a heart attack in 1955, it was his chief physician who gave a press conference detailing a few ways Americans could avoid heart disease by cutting down on fat, cholesterol, and cigarettes. During this time, the only nutritional authorities in people's lives were government officials and primary care physicians. And both of these sources began to promote low-fat diets for a healthy lifestyle, armed with the trusted and widespread scientific hypothesis that saturated fat was the sole culprit for America's declining health and rising rates of obesity. It was believed and promoted that if we eat fat, we will be fat. And this diet fad persisted for over 40 years. The fat scare gave rise to a tidal wave of added sugars and lab-grown frankensugars. High fructose corn syrup is a sweetener made from cornstarch, first introduced in the 1970s by the Clinton Corn Processing Company. And it took off because it was cheaper and easier to handle than regular sugar. Over the years, corporations began manufacturing low-fat diet-specific foods, and these low-calorie and low-fat processed foods often had sugar added for flavor. Without the sugar, they tasted like cardboard. So these foods that were heavily marketed as healthy were anything but. High fructose corn syrup managed to find its way into not only the obvious sources like soda, ice cream, candy, and cakes, but into salad dressings, sandwich breads, pastas, crackers, and frozen dinners. Places where you would never expect there to be added sugars. According to the Corn Refiners Association, high fructose corn syrup is no worse for you than any other carbohydrate. But since the advent of high fructose corn syrup being introduced into the American diet, there's overwhelming evidence to suggest that's anything but the truth. Along the way, there were individuals who tried to warn us that fructose consumption was steadily increasing right alongside the obesity epidemic, and there could be a correlation and cause for concern. In 1972, John Yudkin, a British professor of nutrition, published his book, Pure White and Deadly, detailing the hazards of added sugars. Sugar industry professionals and nutritionist colleagues went out of their way to discredit and ridicule Yudkin. Had his findings and research not been suppressed, his work could have saved millions, but instead, he was attacked and ultimately, his career was destroyed because he didn't go along with accepted science. Sound familiar? Rather recently, reports have revealed that the US sugar lobby paid for influential research in the 1960s to downplay the link between sugar and coronary heart disease and instead point the finger at fat. Let me repeat that again for my people in the back. Scientists, experts who most folks rely on to find and relay facts, peddled their selective research while repressing conflicting research at the expense of every single American. 
Not only that, but ethical professionals were destroyed for questioning the findings and authority of these compromised individuals. All the while, government officials line their pockets with dirty dollars from lobbyists to promote that profoundly flawed and sponsored science. Because lobbying is totally legal here in the United States. Our entire food pyramid that was introduced in 1992 is basically just a product of lobbying. I remember being taught the food pyramid in my elementary school, which was a government-run public school. And we had to memorize the number of healthy servings of each food group that adults were allowed per day, ranging from six to 11 servings of bread, cereal, rice, pasta, and other whole grains a day, to three to five servings of vegetables and two to three servings of dairy. Teachers instructed students that grains prevented heart disease and red meat caused it. Meanwhile, that same year, our school field trip was a tour of the world of Coca-Cola, where we got to sample flavors of Coke from around the world. If you grew up with a television inside your home and attended public school where you were taught the food pyramid, it's likely that you've tried to adhere to the guidelines to make some attempt at physical longevity. And you're not stupid. You're not drinking a can of Coke under the impression that it's doing something beneficial for your body. But you might drink a glass of grocery store orange juice or juice cocktail under the false pretense that it's healthy. But if you look at the label, it contains as much, if not more sugar than a can of Coke with none of the fiber of an actual piece of fruit. And while you're at it, you've gotta work some whole grains into your diet because the food pyramid says so. And if you look at the label, most of the cereals, crackers, pastas, and breads have heaps of added sugar. And each time you go to the grocery store, it's becoming more and more difficult to spot on the labels because high fructose corn syrup has such a horrible reputation that they've concealed its presence by switching out its name. Even the snacks for babies that are considered healthy, according to the label on the box, have tons of added sugar. That is to say, if you're even lucky enough to reproduce because insulin resistance wreaks havoc on the reproductive system, then not even your baby is safe from disgusting corporate greed. While sugar alone is not responsible for the obesity epidemic and health crisis, these refined added sugars are a deadly food additive, and they're killing millions upon millions of people a year. Sugar can certainly have its time and place as long as you're choosing to eat it, but the problem is that most people don't even realize they're eating it. According to the CDC, 71% of American adults are now considered overweight. 40% of American adults are obese, and a startling 20% of adolescents ages 12 to 19 are obese. It is known that people who are obese have higher rates of cancer, diabetes, and other preventable conditions. Published only a week ago, a new study has found that life expectancy rates are continuing to decline with adults ages 25 to 64 being the age group that saw the largest increase in mortality rates with deaths associated with obesity and hypertension. So let's ask the question, who is benefiting from the obesity epidemic? Certainly not the average American. The mega corporations that produce a lion's share of food sold in grocery stores benefit, the fast food companies benefit, the diet industry benefits, government officials who are bought and paid for by these lobbies benefit, scientists who peddle selective research for money benefit, and the more obese the person, the more likely they are to suffer from a disease or condition which will then be treated and monitored in a healthcare facility and managed by pharmaceuticals. So I think it's fair to say that the pharmaceutical industry benefits too. While in recent years, the correlation between excess sugar intake and obesity has been addressed in the news, it seems to come in the form of a plea for government intervention. I will never advocate for more government on this channel. When you rely on the government to tell you what's good for you, you get a food pyramid, worth less than the paper they printed on. Let's face it, no government is going to come and save us. How much bought and paid for science do they need to push for us to realize that all they do is manipulate the public to further specific agendas? Corporations run the world. Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Nestle. These are some of the most evil corporations ever. We've allowed these corporations to poison our bodies for decades. We're nothing more than human guinea pigs in their never ending experiment on society. Why support them? During the age of agricultural abundance, when so much of the American diet is comprised of manufactured components of food, and processed foods are the cheapest and most widely available foods at the grocery store, it's true that we're better fed now more than 
any time in history, but were also less nourished. Most people have no idea where their food comes from, and the personal connection to agriculture that once existed is a thing of the past. Something's gotta give. Society is headed down such a dangerous path. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be dependent on pharmaceuticals at any point in my life. I don't want to die from a totally preventable disease. I've got things to do and dying early would really put a damper on things. I realize it takes a lot of time to cook food that isn't from a package, and that many people don't want to take the time after a stressful day of work to cook a wholesome dinner. And not only that, but they often don't have the energy to after a long work day. But it really seems like the only way out is to stop trading your health for convenience. We've got to make dinner at home and eat whole foods and eliminate the processed stuff by training our bodies not to crave these synthetically sweet frankenfoods. On an anecdotal note, I would never propose something to you I wouldn't practice myself. So starting on September 1st, I decided to limit my sugar intake and eat a low carbohydrate diet with an emphasis on whole unprocessed foods. I didn't change my caloric intake and I continued incorporating intermittent fasting into my routine as I had before. I documented the process by taking a photograph of my face every month and I mean you can tell just from the decrease in my face bloat that my body thanked me for making this change. I ended up losing over 20 pounds in September and I feel so good that I'm absolutely not going to stop. I also really love gardening. Homegrown fruits and vegetables always taste better and it's a great way to be less dependent on grocery stores and corporations for sustenance. I am by no means a prolific or expert gardener. It's a lot of trial and error for me in my own personal agricultural empire, but I enjoy the process nonetheless. Almost as much as I enjoy seeing pictures of your homegrown food and impressive gardens that you share with me. So what do you think internet friends? Do you go out of your way to avoid high fructose corn syrup and processed foods? Have you ever tried to cut out refined sugars from your diet? What was your experience? Let me know, you know I always look forward to your comments. Thank you so much for watching, subscribing, and supporting my channel on Patreon. Bye!